I've been asked to read from the book of Matt, Luke, chapter 9, verse 62. If you wish to follow along in your pew Bible, they can be found on page 917, 917. Again, Luke 9, verse 62. And it says, But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. This morning we have Brother Matthew Bransford with us. He'd been with us two or three times before. We're glad that he's able to make it today. His wife Kim is with him, so be sure and introduce yourselves to him. We've met many of you already, but we we're looking forward to a good sermon from Matt. Well, it is good to be back with you once again where we can and already have been worshiping our, and honoring our God. And, and we'll continue to do that as we look at our lesson this morning. As you saw, I kind of got ahead of myself coming on up here. But that, in a way, will go along with the message this morning. And that is that we'll never want to look back, but we always want to continue to move forward. And so just as I was jumping ahead of myself... We always want to be looking forward, always moving forward, never looking back or moving back. You see, as human beings, there are so many ways in which we are alike. But as individuals, we hold many different traits. We hold many different physical traits. Each and every one of us, we have different personalities. And we were all raised in different ways. You see, you may be here this morning and perhaps you were fortunate enough to grow up in a home where God was praised, to grow up in a home where God was honored. And perhaps these things helped guide you into a relationship with Christ at a very early age. On the other hand, you may be here this morning and, and perhaps you obeyed the gospel and were added to the Lord's church late in life. You also may be here this morning and, and perhaps you're still studying. Perhaps you're still looking through the scriptures and you're, you're trying to find that truth. Well, let me assure you that you are in the right place this morning. And I encourage you to follow along in your Bible as we study God's Word this morning and let us see what lessons we can learn this morning you see, whatever the circumstance, though, however you may have been raised, there is one thing that is for sure. And that is that each and every one of us, that we have made some mistakes along the way. We have all done some things that now we regret. Things that as we look back on them, we understand. And, and especially as we get a little bit older, we know that we can't go back and change the things that we have done. As a matter of fact, some of those things, while we were doing them, perhaps we enjoyed them. Perhaps those were things that we really enjoyed while we were in the middle or the midst of doing them. But now we have left them behind. We have left those things in the past. And we have now turned to walk in newness of life. To continue to move forward. Not looking back. Not going back to those things. But to always be moving forward. You see, sometimes... Those things, those things from our past, they can haunt us. As a matter of fact, some of those things, remember, even those things at one time we may have enjoyed, they can even still be a temptation for us. And it doesn't matter in age. It doesn't matter because each and every one of us have something that maybe we allow to kind of haunt or even tempt us as we uh, consider things that we have done before. So the question that we have this morning or that I have for us this morning is what do we do about those things from the past? 
And as we move through this lesson, what we're going to see is we're going to see that we leave those things right where they're at. That is, that we leave them in the past. Never looking back. Always looking forward. Listen to the following. It's, it's a poem that was written. It's entitled, Changing the Past. It was written by Donna. No last name was given. But listen to the following. It says, the past is the past for a reason. That is where it's supposed to stay. But some cannot let it go. In their heads it eats away until all their focus becomes the person they used to be. The mistakes they made in their life, oh, if only they could see. That you cannot change what happened no matter how hard you try, No matter how much you think about it, no matter how much you cry, what happens in your life happens for reasons sometimes unknown. So you have to let the cards unfold, let your story be shown. Don't get wrapped up in the negative. Be happy with what you have been given. Live for today, not tomorrow. Get up, get out, and start living. Because the past is a past for a reason. Keep that in mind. The past is a past for a reason. It's been and now is gone. So stop trying to think of ways to fix it. It's done. It's unchangeable. Move on. Remember our scripture reading that was read? The scripture reading that was read, Luke 9 and verse 62, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, you take the reins, there you are, and you're plowing what? Forward? But what happens if you're plowing forward and you're looking back at the same time? You're going to be veering all over the place. Imagine this, imagine trying to drive your car forward and looking back. It's not going to work out too well for you. So we're always to be having our minds, our eyes, our hands, everything focused on moving forward. Let's take and open our Bibles together to the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 19, if you remember in Bible class, if you were here for Bible class, we were saying we were going to get to this section of Scripture. Let's turn in our Bibles together to Genesis chapter 19. Here in Genesis chapter 19, we have the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And these cities were full of nothing but wickedness. Now when I say that they were full of nothing but wickedness, we're talking about those who were wicked. Those, from, those who were old, those who were young. From every quarter of the city, you could find those who were wicked. And because of this wickedness, God was going to come and He was going to utterly destroy these cities. Now, for just a moment, consider that word, destroy. Because this word, destroy, it actually holds a very strong meaning. And here's what it means. It means to ruin the structure of by tearing it to shreds. Listen to this. Putting it out of existence. In other words, it wouldn't be left. In other words, no stone would be on left unturned, right? All was going to be destroyed. But listen, there was going to be some who would be despaired. There were going to be some who were going to be spared. Lot, his wife, two of their daughters. Now if you remember this situation found in Genesis chapter 19, and we'll get there in just a moment, but think about this. If you back up, and I'm talking about mentally, If you back up to chapter 18, if you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to go and read that context. But if we back up to Genesis chapter 18, and you remember how Abraham, there he is, he's in the doorway of his tent, he looks out, and he sees these three men slash angels, he sees them coming, and he runs out to greet them. And he wants them to stay with him. As a matter of fact, he has them stay underneath the shade of this tree. He goes and gets water for them to drink, water for them to wash their feet. And he runs back to the tent where he finds his wife Sarah. And he encourages her to begin to bake these goods or cakes for them. 
And he goes and he finds a calf and he prepares that calf. And he takes all of these things to them and and they eat. Well, after spending some time with Abraham and Sarah, I'm talking about these three men, these angels. After spending some time with them, the men then turned toward Sodom. This is where they were heading the whole time. Here they are. They want to see if this outcry is true. And so here they're turning toward Sodom and for their destruction. Now, remember, these are things that ultimately they would discuss with Abraham. He knew that this is where they were going to, this is where they were going, and this is what was going to happen. And so Abraham, knowing that he had relatives there, he began to plead. Well, hold a second. If you find 50 that are righteous, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? If you find 40 or 30 or all the way down to 10, and they said, no, they won't be destroyed. If we find those who are righteous, we will not destroy. So the angels or the men, they went to these cities and they began to search. When they entered the city, Lot is the one that welcomed them in to stay with them. Ultimately, they found Lot, his wife, two of their daughters, to be righteous and they would be spared. So as you come then to Genesis chapter 19, I want you to read with me. Let's read this together. Let's read beginning in verse 15. Because here's what we find. Remember I said that they stayed with Lot that night. Well, here's what we find now that it's the next day. And beginning in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 19, you notice when the morning had dawned, the angels urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, The men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. So it came to pass, when they had brought brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. So here we find instruction That is being given to Lot, isn't it? Lot is to take himself, his family, and he's to head to the mountains where they would find safety, where they would find security, where they would remain uh, living. They would find this life or have this life and not be destroyed with these cities. But did you notice the strict instruction? Not to look back. Continue to read with me in verse 18. Then Lot said to them, Please know, my lords, indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. Now from what I understand, the... uh, that which Lot was con, uh, concerned about, the evil that he was worried about overtaking him, would have been wild beast. And so his point is, look, if I stay here, I'm destroyed. If I go into the mountains, I could be destroyed by these wild beasts. And so he's pleading, and he continues to plead in verse 19, or excuse me, in verse 20. See now, this city is near enough to flee, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said to him, See, I have favored, favored you concerning this thing also, and that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you have arrived there. And therefore the name of the city was called Zoar, or tiny place, or small. So then you notice the instruction there that's given. And as you continue to read, then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So He overthrew those cities, all the plains, all the inhabitants of the city, and what grew on the ground. Do you remember the word destroy? Everything was going to be gone. 
even that which was on the ground, all was destroyed, all was wiped out. But, verse 26, but his wife. That is, but Lot's wife looked behind and she became a pillar of salt. So Lot's wife looked back and was destroyed. And although we're not given the reason of why she looked back, what we do know is we know the end result. And the end result was she looked back and she was destroyed. See, sometimes we can do that very same thing. Sometimes we can look back on those things that we have left in the past, those things, remember, that seem to sometimes can haunt us, can tempt us, and sometimes we can look too long, and those things can grab hold. Start bringing you back in. Wanting you to come back and enjoy those times again. And the end result, though, remember, it would be to be destroyed. Consider this with me. If you turn over to the book of Proverbs with me, I want you to consider Proverbs 26. And when we look at and wind, uh, wind up in Proverbs 26 together, I want you to consider one verse with me, and that's verse 11. So Proverbs 26 and verse 11, let's read this together. Notice, as a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. So this dog is returning to something that he, that is, that his body has already rejected, right? His body has already rejected that which has, it's already deemed as something being unhealthy. It has already deemed it as being something that is unbeneficial or not beneficial. And has rejected that. And and the example is this dog now is going to return to that which his body has already rejected. And what is the comparison that the Bible makes for us? As a fool repeats or returns to his folly. Or his foolishness or his silliness. He returns to that. Let me go ahead and use this word. He returns to that which is unrighteous. Something that he has already rejected. He, she, they've already rejected it. They've already turned away from it. They left it in the past. Why? Because they knew it was uh, not beneficial to them. And now they look to return to it once again. That which, remember was left in the past for a reason. You remember when we read that in our poem? That which was left in the past is left there for a reason. You know, when we think about looking back on anything, because if we went around and we asked each individual, what is something that you could look back on? All of us would have something, and all of us would have something that is different. But consider this, sometimes when we look back, we may not have in our mind, hey, I'm going to return to that. But what we allow it to do is we allow it to have guilt over us. We allow it to have this guilt, this power of guilt over us. Things that we have already, again, that we have left behind. Things that we have already repented of. Things that we have already been forgiven of when we follow the proper steps of forgiveness. Things that have already been left behind, but we will dwell on them until we're overwhelmed with guilt. And so while we may may never return to those things, In fact, they do hold us back from moving forward as we should because we allow that guilt now to hold us steady. Right where we are. Well, see, I want you to remember something that Paul wrote. And I know that we are so familiar with this. It's found in the book of Romans. If you want to turn over there with me to Romans chapter 6, 
I want you to remember this because Paul there, what he's talking about is, hey, that which we're our slave to is that which we obey. Are we a slave to guilt? Or are we a slave to that which we have already left behind? That which we have already been forgiven of? Let's read this. In Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now what? Ashamed. For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end is everlasting life. And so those who repent, turn away from those things, those sinful acts, they have been set free from the bondage of sin. Set free from the wages of sin. And the ultimate result of that would be death. Verse 23. Well, if we've been set free from that and we're no longer a slave to that and we're no longer a slave to it because what did Paul say? What fruit? What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? Did it produce anything good? Did it ever... Produce anything that is righteous? Well, no, that's why it's left where it's at. That's why it's left in the past, right where it should be. And so, brethren, we never wanted to look back or hold back or allow guilt to hold us back from anything in our past. We want to always be looking forward. You know, we mentioned Paul here in Romans, in the book of Romans. Let's continue to think about Paul for just a moment. If you turn over to the book of Philippians, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul here describes about moving forward. In Philippians chapter 3, I want you to read with me, beginning in verse 12. Here's Paul, and here's what he says. Not that I have already obtained, or I'm already perfected, but look, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Now notice, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, Paul here is encouraging the brethren not to look back, but to always be moving, to always be pressing forward, pressing and moving forward to that ultimate prize. Some of us may think, well, you don't know what I've done. Well, we know what Paul or Saul did, don't we? We know that he said, I'm the chief of sinners. I was a persecutor of the church. He was taking Christians and placing them in prison. He stood and held the cloak of Stephen as he was stoned. All of these things that Paul did, but what does he say here? I'm forgetting about all of that. Because now I've got to move forward. Now I am going to press forward. You know, this also reminds me of... The children of Israel, we were talking about them in Bible class a little bit. But you remember the children of Israel, how we discussed how that they were in bondage? How that they were in physical bondage to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt? And they cried out to God to be delivered, to be set free? And so God sent Moses to Pharaoh, and He sent him with a message. And, and I'm sure that you know what that message was, remember? Let my people go. Why? That they may serve me. They don't need to be held here. They need to move forward so that they can serve me. Well, see, Pharaoh had no intention of letting them go, did he? As long as I'm giving them room and board, I've got free labor. Why would I let them go? And so his heart became 
hardened. He wasn't going to let them go. As a matter of fact, remember, he even said, Who is this Lord that you speak of? Well, God reveals who He was, and He began the plagues, if you remember rightly. He would turn the water into blood. He would send the frogs and the lice. He would send the flies. He would disease the livestock. It went all the way to the tenth plague. It would be the death of the firstborn. And finally, Pharaoh gave in. Pharaoh would set the people free. As a matter of fact, he said, look, Moses, take these people and go. He had no. And so Moses gathers the people and they gather all of their, their things. They start heading out. They start heading out and if you remember, as we turn together to the book of Exodus, because we'll be there in just a moment, Exodus chapter 14. Here they go, they're leaving, they're walking away from what would now become their past, and they're moving forward to their future. Their future to serve God. But they didn't get too far before Pharaoh changed his mind once again. And here come the soldiers of Pharaoh coming after the children of Israel. There they are. They're right there at the sea. They turn around there. They see the army coming upon them. And what do they do? They halted. <laughs> they stopped right where they were at. In other words, they're paralyzed in fear. And you may remember that when Moses, when he came to deliver them out of the hand of Pharaoh, how that Pharaoh would make increase their labor Okay, we're no longer going to bring the straw to you. You're going to go out, you're going to collect it, and you're going to have double the work or the quota. Imagine what they might be thinking now. If we're caught and we're taken back once again to Egypt, what is it going to be like now? And so here they are, paused in fear. But I want you to notice what Moses told them. In Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 13, look, and Moses said to the people, what? Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Now notice, the Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, now look, if you're not reading along right now, read along with me in verse 15. The Lord will fight for you. And then you notice that the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. In other words, here they are standing in fear to the point that they would no longer move. They would no longer turn and move forward. They were frozen and fear. But what happened when they did turn? What happened when they did turn and begin to move? Let me ask you something. What did God do? God made a way for them. Didn't he? If you notice in verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on the left. You see, when they stopped fearing, when they stop looking behind them, seeing their past coming after them, pursuing them, and they turn and they move forward, that God made that way. And they were able to escape their past. But let me ask you something. Did it end there? No. <laughs> no, it didn't end there. They weren't giving up. Because even as you continue to read the soldiers came in after them. 
their past was still going to come after them. But remember what Moses said, the Lord will fight for you. In verse 26, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on the chariots, and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Now look, not so much as one of them remained. What would we say? He destroyed them. Not as much as them as one remained. That which they looked back on, that which they had feared, is destroyed. There was nothing more to look back on. They were now to keep moving forward, to serve the Lord, weren't they? You remember we talked about when one follows the proper steps of repentance, obeying the gospel, confessing Christ as Lord, being baptized, fully immersed, and they, they're raised to walk in newness of life. Why? Because everything is forgotten. Now one sin remains. It's all a new start. So why is there anything to look back on? Well, the children of Israel, they moved on. They moved on, just as we know that they did. But listen, they came across some hard times along the way. They came across some hard times. Many of the problems that they came across were self-inflicted. But they did come across some hard times. Matter of fact, it wasn't too long from being removed from this situation. Remember what they said? We wish we were back in Egypt. When those hard times hit, what did they want to do? Want to go back. They wanted to go back. The very thing that they had feared, the very thing that they had cried out to God to rescue them from, now hard times hit, we want to go back. I thought it was going to be easy. I thought everything was going to work out now. See, maybe they weren't willing to strive. And I use that word because you remember what Christ, you remember what He said in Luke chapter 13 and verse 34? He said, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For I say to you, many will seek to enter and will not be able to. You know what the word strive means? The word strive means to devote serious effort and energy. To struggle to get through. And so there's going to be hard times. Even as a Christian, there's going to be hard times that come. But let us never be looking back. Thinking, no, oh, it was easier then. Let us always strive and push forward. What would have happened if Lot's wife had just kept moving forward? What if she had never looked back? What was promised? What was promised to be for her and those with her right in front? Life. Safety. Rest from this destruction. Well, brethren, if we keep moving forward, never looking back on those things which we have left behind, if we keep pressing and striving forward, then we also have a promise of life. Eternal life is what I'm talking about. We have a promise of rest. We have a promise where, listen, there's going to be no more death, no more tears, all of these things if we will just continue to move forward. Always striving, always moving ahead, no matter what may come upon us. And I want you to consider this with me. 
in Revelation chapter 21, and, and mainly I want to consider the very uh, end of the verse. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4, it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Now look, for the former things have passed away. Where are they at? In the past. You see, this is a promise that is a guarantee promise that will not fade away as Peter said, wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4 and so if Lot's wife had never looked back if she had never turned around she had safety, she had life in front of her and while we may not know why she turned around, what caused her to turn around, what did she look back to while we're not given any specifics, we can use that to our advantage. Because as I said, each and every one of us has something that we could put there and say, I can no longer look back on that situation. I no longer need to allow it to have guilt over me. I no longer need to allow it to haunt me tempt me. But to always be moving forward. Remember I said that we've all were raised in different ways. Remember I was talking about how there may be someone here this morning who is continuing to study. They're looking for the truth. Well, let me tell you something. This morning you have the opportunity to be able to take that first step in moving forward and leaving what you have been doing, leave it in the past, make that your past. And move forward this morning. How? Well, let me tell you there's some good news. And it was mentioned when we took the Lord's Supper, and that is that Christ, when He came to this earth, He gave His body, He shed His blood, He gave it all. That we could have salvation through Him. And when we hear that wonderful news that not only did He die, but He resurrected to live forevermore. And that He's coming back to get those who will faithfully follow Him. When we hear that wonderful and great news, and we believe that, then we're going to come and we're going to confess Christ, that He is Lord, He is my King. I want to leave my past to serve him. We're going to repent. To turn away from the things of the world. We'll be baptized, fully immersed, and then be raised to walk in newness of life. If you are a child of God, and perhaps maybe you have been struggling with things from your past, Perhaps maybe you've been struggling with guilt over the things from your past. And you need prayer, you need strength. Perhaps you need somebody to study further with you. Listen, however we can help assist you this morning, won't you come as together as we stand and as we sing.